um, project very well. <laughs> so, but welcome very much. And this is to talk about, um, what was our title? Migrant sex workers in Australia, trafficking myths and con misconceptions. I think one of the reasons that we, we thought about doing this was certainly um, as a result and in response to the Four Corners story. Um, how many people in here saw the Four Corners story? Yeah, it was shocking, wasn't it? It was emotive, frightening, um, and it certainly, what was even more frightening was government's response to it. Um, New South Wales government, you know, almost the next day said, oh my God, you know, we've got to regulate, we've got to introduce more laws. The only way we're going to deal with this is more laws, clamp down, more raids, more, um, more red tape and, and more controls. That's the only way we're going to deal with this. Victorian government said something similar, and I suspect we will hear similar from, from governments around Australia. So tonight we'd like to talk about, well, there would be another way to look at this. And um, Scars Alliance, for Eleanor Jeffries, I mean, they've been looking at this issue for over 22 years, and they've been doing some amazing stuff. Like, I don't know, educating sex workers from other countries about their rights for visas. Educating them about how they can work in this country legally. So, and it's something that certainly the Australian Sex Party has advocated for many years, enable sex workers to work legally in this country. Um, empower sex workers, create opportunities for them to work, and then you can cut out the middleman. Um, and yes, if we have a problem with trafficking, and when I went to a trafficking conference 10 or 15 years ago, and just even the definition of trafficking was so difficult. I mean, really, anyone who owed money to anyone and was working, well, as a sex worker, I mean, if you owed money and were working as a priest, or you owed money and were working as a computer programmer, you were trafficked. Of course, if you owed money and were working as a sex worker, well, obviously, you were trafficked and you were totally disempowered and you'd obviously made, not been able to make any decisions for yourself. Um, so Scarlett has been working a lot on policies in this area. The Sex Party has been as well. Um, uh, as I mentioned at this conference, I met with Philip Ruddock and suggested, I don't know, visas. And he just said, oh my God, you know, you want, you want Australian government to accept sex work visas for sex workers. He thought this was entirely laughable and just couldn't believe that what planet I was on or what I'd been smoking. Um, so this evening we have Eleanor Jeffries from, this, from the Scarlet Alliance and after her will be Andrew Patterson who was a candidate for the New South Wales, as, well for the sex party in New South Wales. Um, he is a recovering police officer. Um, and Eleanor Jeffries, I suspect most people in the room know her as the pres president still of the Australian Scarlet Alliance. I'd ask that don't let, let them speak. We will have plenty of time for questions after they have spoken this evening. And we are filming the event, but if you don't want to be on the camera, don't stand here. Okay, thank you. Please welcome Eleanor Jeffries. Um, thank you so much, and what a warm welcome. Look, we're all here for the same reason, and that is that we understand and we share concern about policy, about sex work, migration in Australia. I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of this land that we are meeting upon, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would like to acknowledge and thank the Sex Party for inviting Scarlet Alliance to come and speak here tonight. And I would also like to acknowledge that Scarlet Alliance as a national peak body of sex workers represents sex worker issues has a policy of affirmative action. I myself am a, sec am a sex worker and the people who are elected within Scarlet Alliance, our staff, our representatives, our volunteers, are sex workers. And we recognise that not everyone who's worked as a sex worker in Australia has the privilege of being out about their sex work background and history. So I'd like to first of all acknowledge all of those of you in the room with sex work experience, your experience is important 
and I'm not going to pretend to represent the minute of your experience tonight. And Scarlet Lights would never pretend that we can do that for every sex worker in Australia. But what we do draw upon is a body of evidence that we feel is incredibly reliable and that we feel can inform all of us as sex workers and allies about what is actually going on in our industry. Scarlet Alliance is a peak body and our voting membership are the sex worker organisations in Australia that deliver services to sex workers in the form of peer education. These services were first funded in the 1980s in the, uh, as part of the HIV response because sex worker communities were already mobilising in response to HIV, already doing the work on the ground, and when governments turned to see where they could invest in HIV prevention, the natural partner was the sex worker community who were already delivering really important, strong HIV prevention messages and tools on the ground in Australia. In Australia, that HIV response is called the partnership response. And Scarlet Alliance and our membership and the work that we do is recognised in every word of the national HIV and STI strategies on every committee in response to HIV and on all of the different um, uh, government consultative bodies that inform government about how to maintain the partnership response to HIV in Australia. To say that that response has been successful is an understatement. We've just had the latest um, National Centre for HIV Social Research um, uh, surveillance data released for 2011 and once again it shows that female sex workers in Australia have the lowest prevalence of any grouping in Australia for HIV and that um, and the injecting drug use as a factor has no impact on female sex workers HIV status in Australia. So that um, is a, a, a stat that keeps can rolls out continually year in and year out in the surveillance data and we are a country that invests a lot of money in the um, contact tracing and epidemiology in relationship to HIV and we can speak with so, so much confidence um, about that result. When it comes Thank you. And yeah, the sex workers, we deserve, um, we deserve a massive uh, uh, amount of recognition um, on, for our work on that issue. When it comes to the issue of migration and trafficking, sex worker communities around the world have been incredibly stymied. In 2004, at the Asia Pacific Regional Networking Meeting of sex worker organisations from all around Asia and the Pacific. There was over 30 countries represented with speakers from key, um, what is known in policy speak as source countries for trafficking around the region, Cambodia, Thailand, Philippines, all represented at that meeting. One of the key problems for sex worker organisations in the region was the impact of trafficking policy and the direct detrimental effect that it had on sex worker organisations' ability to even be heard in a policy sense in their own countries. There is no doubt that the Bush regime <coughs> invested a lot of money in religious groups and in some uh, feminist organisations who set up quite large and successful rescue organisations that are funded in countries like Thailand and India that run what we can only describe as detention centres and yes, they are called rescue centres. Somali man is the current day version of that in Cambodia. Receiving money from the US government, 
were having huge fundraisers, to, uh, apparently to stop trafficking in that in Cambodia in that country. And yet the centres where supposedly rescued sex workers are sent in that country don't even have enough rice to feed the people that are in there. Sexual assault and violence against people in detention in the rescue centres in India, in the rescue centres in Thailand and the rescue centres in Cambodia is common. And in Thailand, they've actually placed their biggest rescue centre on an island because sex workers trying to escape from the forced rescue environment is so common that they basically run it like a jail. So I'm going to hark back now, just momentarily, to what the STI response was to sex workers 100 years ago in this country. And that was any police officer at any time pick up any sex worker and put them in a locked hospital, which was essentially a jail, with no method of engagement, um, that, you know, no judge, no jury, no penicillin, no treatment, and no release unless a person in that jail or a police officer at that time decided to let that person go. That is the face of the anti-trafficking reality in developing countries in our region. It is nothing more than a policing response to sex work and the word trafficking inserted where convenient to make um, many in developed countries feel that these responses are worthy of funding. Sex workers in our region are loud and proud and militant and protesting and out on the streets being very clear about our opposition to trafficking responses. Where this becomes incredibly difficult in a policy setting is that the stereotype of a trafficked sex worker is someone who is meek, forced, without a voice, in a dark room, unable to speak, unable to escape, unless police or a rescuer comes and helps them. That stereotype, that imaginary stereotype of what a sex worker is, who is affected by a trafficking situation, doesn't fit with the actual public face of sex worker voice and sex worker activism in the countries that we're speaking of. And I particularly want to point to somewhere like South Korea, developed country, most sex workers have a university education. We're talking about middle class people who are out on the streets protesting thousands and thousands at a time against, um, you know, even in the face of police brutality. They are protesting not only against the trafficking laws that criminalise them. They're protesting not only against the closure of their workplaces that was pushed by the um, US State Department's trafficking in persons report that really influences the South Korean government um, to, to close down massive brothel districts. They're protesting not only against the gentrification of their suburbs that has meant that business has supported the closure of brothel areas as well because business wants to develop those areas and having it as a red light district is bad for real estate. They're protesting not only against Sheila Jeffries who's visiting that, um, that, that country's government and urging that country to maintain the criminalisation of sex work. They are also protesting against the stereotype that they cannot have a political voice on the landscape when it comes to trafficking issues. This is a major problem in Australia and it is one all of us must face. When Four Corners couldn't find a trafficked sex worker to interview, they um, substituted with shady recreations, spooky music and shadows and footage from cars. When 7.30 report just, you know, in the same week couldn't find a trafficked sex worker to give evidence to their arguments that, you know, oh, the state government must respond with licensing in order to stop trafficking. They substituted 
with footage shot out of a car of street-based sex workers on William Street. They substituted with mobile phone footage non-consensually taken inside Asian brothels where the actual, just the ethnicity of a person, simply being an Asian sex worker in Australia is enough for the media to draw that link and to say, oh, this has something to do with trafficking. I'm really glad that everyone's come out tonight to, you know, to debate and discuss and to ask questions about this issue because we should all be very concerned. When sex worker organisations in developing countries in our region are actually, they are competing for funding for their own HIV services, they are competing for funding against rescue organisations that are working hand in hand with the local police to forcibly rescue people from their workplaces and take take them to essentially detention centres on islands where people might have to stay for up to eight years doing manual labour at, 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 at the profit of the Thai government. And when this is happening in our region, we really need to be taking a strong, hard look at ourselves at, at Australia, which is defined as a destination country for trafficking, and asking, what is it that we can do in Australia that makes life easier for migrant sex workers who are migrating here. And the primary thing that Scarlet Lights has been arguing for for 22 years is to not put up blocks to sex worker migration. If sex workers can access safe migration for work to Australia, then there is no need for third parties to be involved. There is no need for people to find themselves in situations of exploitation. And we have a legalised, decriminalised and tolerated sex industry environment here in Australia. We believe that there is no need for trafficking to be happening in Australia at all. I'd just like to um, finish on one point about the um, Howard Government um, anti-trafficking laws. When they came into place, we, Scarlet Lines was heavily involved in the submission process, the, um, the anti-corruption committee inquiries, and then the follow-up Senate inquiries that happened when the legislation was being written. Every single grouping at those inquiries questioned the power and the, um, the weight that was being given to the anti-trafficking laws in Australia. Trafficking in Australia is as criminal as terrorism. And what we are essentially talking about is a crime that is occurring in a workplace. There is a reason why that the, there is the one trafficking case in Australia that didn't happen to a sex worker, that actually happened to a person of Indian background who was found to be in a trafficking-like um, work environment in the hospitality industry in Australia, there's a reason why that person opted to go through a civil process instead. They went through an industrial relations process instead and they dropped the trafficking court case. And that is because civil processes are quick, civil processes don't cost a lot of money, civil processes don't have an impact on your substantive visa, the civil processes don't mean that you need to be in a form of police witness um, environment. The sex workers in Australia that have bravely decided to make to access justice through our anti-trafficking laws in this country are in a new nightmare of our own creating. That nightmare includes having to access um, a, a, a specific visa to be a, a police, like a police justice um, witness visa in order to stay in Australia. It includes a lot of engagement with police and welfare and service organisations in order to continue to um, be uh, treated as a, re a reliable witness, never being too far away from where police or lawyers or um, you know, a Department of Immigration might want you to be. It means potentially having to give up 
um, travel to see your children. It means potentially having to give up um, all of your travel options while you wait for up to six or eight years for a court case to be realised. Now that response, which was designed in Australia by the Howard government, when it hit the committee system of the Senate, every single submission and every single group in this country, including the church groups, all the human rights groups, and the Human Rights Commission here in Australia, questioned why the laws needed to be so heavy. There was only one group that wholeheartedly supported those laws, and that was the abolitionist group in Melbourne, Project Respect. And that should give us all a bit of a grasp of what this landscape is about. Because if abolitionist feminists were lining up with John Howard to create the nightmare laws that we have now in Australia, and they're lining up with the Victorian government to create the new criminalisation of you know, thousands of sex workers in that state, there is an agenda with the anti-trafficking rhetoric that is being pushed in Australia. That agenda does not help migrant sex workers who want to travel here. It doesn't help migrant sex workers who are already here. And it actually harms all current sex workers in Australia, migrant or not. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I'm really looking forward to questions um, and clarifying things during questions. But um, again, thanks so much to the Sex Party for in inviting me today. Um, and I really hope this has given you all heaps to think about um, and lots of juicy questions. Okay, <laughs> thanks so much. Questions till after our second speaker has spoken, and just 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 one point that I I get to say because I'm standing here is you look at Sweden where they recriminalised prostitution and they did it on a trafficking agenda, so they actually outlawed prostitution in that country on a trafficking agenda. So <coughs> where we're travelling here is frightening, and and the remarks that Ellen has made so far are frightening. So. But without further ado, the wonderful Andrew Patterson, our recovering police officer, who will, I think, speak with personally. I will. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> A round of applause for Andrew, Thanks, please.